Many people are surprised to find out that rejections are a natural and actually expected part of the patent application process. Um, think of it like this. You know, it's like a negotiation. Um, and for instance, if you were watching a show like American Pickers or uh, Pawn Stars, you know, it wouldn't be very much of a show if there wasn't some sort of negotiation between the buyer and seller. So the patent application process is pretty much the same thing. It's a negotiation and you're trying to get the broadest protection possible and the examiner wants to make sure that you're not getting a protection that is too broad. Okay, so this video is gonna be the top five rejections that you're gonna see during examination. So for those of you who are new here, my name is Dylan Adams. I am a patent attorney and author of the best-selling book, Patents Demystified, which is an insider's guide to protecting ideas and inventions used worldwide, including top universities like Harvard, Stanford, and MIT. You also might recognize me from being featured on CNBC's hit show, The Profit with Marcus Lemonis. So uh, in my practice as a patent attorney, I help clients of all sizes from Fortune 100 companies to startups to Shark Tank companies. And this channel gives you sort of the secrets of how I help these clients succeed. So be sure to subscribe to get more great content on startups and patents and uh, ring that little bell icon so that you get notifications of when new videos come out. All right, let's go ahead and get into the list. So number five is a restriction requirement. And this sounds scary, you know, things are being restricted and it's, and it, and it's bad, but really it's, you know, it's pretty simple. So each patent application is only allowed to have one invention in the application. Um, you can only protect one invention per each application. And a restriction requirement is essentially saying the claims that you have define more than one invention. Um, sometimes there can be simple ways to amend the claims, to get over a restriction requirement, you can argue against it. Other times it just makes sense to cancel some of the claims or withdraw them and then have a separate application to those claims. So that's why restrictions usually aren't that big of a deal and they're gonna be, uh, oftentimes, it's gonna be the first uh, rejection that you're gonna get before substantive examination actually begins. And number four is 112 rejections. And so I'm gonna be using some numbers for the next few entries. And these numbers are sort of shorthand for the code they come from. So when I say 112 rejections, it means rejections under 35 USC section 112. But patent attorneys and other folks will tend to call them 112 rejections. So what these are, these are gonna be a couple of things. It's gonna be lack of support in the description and it's going to be a lack of clarity in the claims. Um, and a lot of times these are honestly fairly technical things that you sh really shouldn't worry about yourself. They seem kind of scary, like, oh, you know, there's not enough support in our specification for the claims and there's a rejection. You, you can't get, you know, the claims allowed because there's, they're, they're ambiguous or uh, the things like that really not that big of a deal. A lot of times the patent examiner wants to see certain language in there, or you just need to point out in the specification, hey, this is where we talk about these things, or, you know, I mean, this would be inherent in the description. Usually these 112 issues aren't that big of a deal, but it's not uncommon to see them in examination. And a lot of times it's sort of kind of lazy stuff that examiners will uh, throw at you. A lot of times they don't fully understand what's going on in the application or haven't read through the specification and they'll kind of throw you these 112 rejections. And number three is 101 rejections. And again, remember, this is, this is referring to section uh, 35 USC, section 101. That's where the name 101 rejections come from. Um, but another name for them is going to be subject matter rejections. And these are another one that tend to freak people out uh, because what the rejection is saying is like, this is not patentable subject matter. Now, it's again, it's, it's not that big of a deal typically. Um, there are some cases where 101 rejections can be problematic, but most of the time, it's the examiner looking for specific language. So what, what it means by a subject matter rejection is the examiner saying, this isn't the type of stuff that can be patented. Now, to step back, so there's the four types of intellectual property, right? So you have trade secrets, you have copyrights, you have trademarks, and then you have patents. And some things are protectable by patents and some things aren't. So for instance, let's say you have a new uh, business slogan or a logo. Well, that's not gonna be patentable. That's better patented with trademark. That's not patentable subject matter. Just as much as if you have a, a great screenplay or you've, you have a painting or you've written a book and you wanna patent it, that wouldn't be patentable subject matter. So there's a, a specific window of things that are patentable. And the examiner you know, has to have certain language in there to have it fit within what is patentable. It has to be a new and useful process or, or a product itself. Those sort of things, that's the right subject matter. 
So typically you're gonna see 101 rejections. Sometimes people will call them Alice rejections. There was a famous case, uh, there's this Alice case that related to computer technology um, that essentially said that abstract ideas aren't patentable. And there's been a lot of uh, issue with that case. Not so much anymore. Um, we're not seeing as many of those rejections, but you'll still hear the term Alice and 101 rejections. Those kind of go hand in hand. But again, a lot of times, the patent examiner just wants to see certain language in there, just wants to see, say, oh, well, you know, make it a non-abstract idea by saying it's a computer implemented method. And, and usually there's gonna be simple things to get over these 101 or Alice rejections. So let your patent attorney focus on these things. Don't worry too much about them. Um, a lot of times, especially these days, it's a lot easier to get over those rejections um, given the, the right type of subject matter. Um, for things like computer hardware and software, it used to be pretty difficult uh, to get those things through. You would always see these one-on-one -on -one rejections be problematic, not so much anymore. Um, you know, it's problematic in things like business methods. That's where um, you may have a hard time overcoming those rejections. But for most applications, one-on-one -on -one rejections aren't that big of a deal. And number two is 102 or novelty rejections. So the next couple entries are gonna to relate to prior art rejections. And so in the examination process, the examiner is gonna do a prior art search. Now, what is prior art? Prior art can be a lot of things. Prior art is really gonna be any technology disclosure that occurred before you filed your patent application. A lot of times prior art that's cited against a patent application is going to be a published patent application or it's going to be an issued patent. That's, I would say 90, 95% of the time, that's the kind of prior that's gonna be cited against you. But prior art can really be any sort of technology disclosure. It could be a scientific paper, it could be a blog post, it could be a product catalog. Um, it, it could be really any sort of technology disclosure. So it's not necessarily always limited to issued patents or published patent applications. And for published patent applications, these can be applications that are still pending. It could be patent applications that, that were abandoned. So it doesn't necessarily even need to be issued uh, patents for it to be prior art. It can be things that are pending or like I said, um, patent applications that never issued or never will issue. That's still considered prior art as long as it's a disclosure of technology. So when it comes to 102 rejections or novelty rejections, that's where the examiner is saying that he or she found one single piece of prior art that anticipates all that you have in the claims. There's one thing that reads directly on that. So the way you deal with 102 rejections is, is you have the option of amending the claims to, di to differentiate over the prior art or you can and or you can argue against the rejection. Say, hey examiner, you got it wrong. You aren't fully understanding the claims that I have or you're not fully understanding the prior art and so it doesn't actually read on what I have claimed. So that's 102 rejections that relate to novelty or um, a single prior art reference. And number one is 103 or obviousness rejections. So this is one of those rejections that you really wanna take seriously and something that you'll see in pretty much every patent application. And when it comes down to it, these are the rejections that are going to make or break the application, as in this is what's gonna allow it, you know, if you can get over these rejections, this is what is gonna allow the application to, to be issued as a patent. And if it's gonna fail, usually it's gonna be because of 103 rejections. A lot of times you're gonna be able to find ways to get over the 102 rejections, but 103 rejections are a lot more difficult. So they're also prior art rejections, just like the novelty rejections. But obviously these rejections are, 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 are different in important ways. So typically it's gonna be a combination of more than one prior art reference. So usually the examiner can't find a single prior art reference that reads on all the elements that you have in your claims. And what the examiner then does is says, okay, well, it would be obvious to combine two or more prior art references to read on all the elements that you have in your claims. So for example, you have, uh, you know, you have one thing and it has uh, these five elements in it that read on the claims. And then another piece of prior art has these other things and it reads on maybe another five elements of the claims. Um, the examiner is saying, hey, if I were to combine these things, it would be obvious to your average person in the field, one of ordinary skill in the art, it'd be obvious for them to combine these things and come to your invention. There'd be a motivation for this person to say, hey, there's this one piece of prior art, there's another piece of prior art, let's combine these things. A lot of times you'll see prior, prior art rejections 
um, for obviousness that relate to two pieces of prior art. But sometimes, you know, you can see prior art rejections for obvious that, that relate to, you know, maybe six, seven, eight pieces of prior art. A lot of times examiners don't like to do that. Um, but those can be really, really tricky where you have all these different pieces of prior art going after these specific elements of the claims and the examiner says, hey, it would be obvious to combine these things. So how do you overcome obviousness rejections? In some ways, it's gonna be pretty much the same way that you're gonna attack the novelty rejections. What you have the option of arguing against and or uh, amending the claims. And what you can do is if you can find something that isn't taught by any of these things, you can amend the claims to add those, add those elements in there and then you can overcome the obvious rejections. Or just as with the novelty rejections, you can say, examiner, you didn't fully understand what we have in our claims. We're describing this, the prior doesn't really describe it. Um, that's not, that, that element isn't satisfied. Or you're not really understanding the prior art. It doesn't really read on what we have in the claims. It's different for these reasons. So that's how you're gonna get over the most common rejection, which is the 103 or obviousness rejection. And that's our list. So one thing I'd like to know from you is, hey, have you ever been through the examination process? Have you received any of these rejections? Were you scared by some of these? Which, which of these rejections was the most scary to you? And you know, which did you have the most problem with? Um, you know, did you, did you face uh, obvious rejections or novelty rejections? Um, and uh, do you have any questions about these rejections or did I miss anything? Any rejections that you faced in examination that uh, you sh should have been on this top five list? I would love to hear, for you, hear from you down in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to the channel, uh, ring that little bell icon. We've got a lot more great content on startups and patents and uh, we'd love to uh, notify you of when those are coming out. So we will see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching.